All right, so I'd like to uh, continue today with uh, an example on the concepts we introduced uh, yesterday, uh, namely Ohm's law and Joule's law. Uh, so this is about the relation between current density, J, uh, let me remind you, so this is uh, volume current density in amps per meter squared. Uh, and uh, sigma is the conductivity uh, that we had introduced uh, uh, yesterday. We formally defined it. The units are Siemens, which is one of our ohms, per meter. And uh, this uh, second law basically tells us the volume density of power dissipated, ohmic power dissipated, because of a current flowing in the conductor, where we have, as you know, um, as the current flows in the conductor, uh, the conductor heats up, that means that the uh, kinetic energy of the electrons uh, is converted into heat. And that uh, power is uh, lost into heat, and therefore it is important from a circuit perspective to actually calculate it. Uh, so here I uh, have an example that we had uh, originally seen in the mute the projector, that we had originally seen when we uh, uh, discussed the Laplace equation and we had solved the, uh, and uh, that involves two conductors, an inner conductor of radius A and an outer conductor of radius B, and the voltage between the conductors is V0. If you go back to the notes for the, Poisson, for the Laplace equation lecture, we had found that the electric field there is V0 by ln B over A uh, R. So the electric field lines point always in the direction of decreasing potential, and therefore they point from the inner conductor to the outer conductor, like this. Now, if we assume that the space in between is covered by a material of conductivity sigma, so let's say that we have here conductivity sigma, uh, then that means the presence of the electric field means that there is also current flowing in the space between the conductors. Obviously, you are expecting current to flow also on the conductors, because that's the role of the conductors in a cable. However, typically materials like dielectric materials that we put in cables, and we will discuss dielectrics a little bit more, also have some small conductivity. And hence, there are stray currents also in the space in between the conductors. These induce losses in cables, and calculating those losses for long cables like power cables and telephone cables uh, is an important uh, task. So that is the task that I will take up, and uh, you see, in, because of uh, the electric field and because of the uh, uh, conductivity, there will be an electric current density with an electric current that flows uh, in the space between the conductors, and that will be sigma e, proportional to the electric field. And we can replace the expression and find the corresponding uh, sigma. The corresponding j, sorry. So then, that means that there is a current and that the cable has an inherent resistance. That resistance we can calculate from its definition voltage from the positive terminal to the negative terminal divided by current and that current can be found from integrating the current density over the cross section. So now the cross section of the current flow is actually This cross section, so the current flow happens from the uh, first cylinder, from the inner cylinder to the outer cylinder. Therefore, if I want to find the current, I have to integrate 
this over a cylindrical surface. And let me define the surface having length L that is uh, pierced, if you wish, by the current. If you want to see this on the cross section, this is the inner conductor. This is the outer conductor. And this is the surface or the cross section of the surface that looks pretty much like the two cylinders, but now it has a radius that is in between A and B. And uh, I need to integrate this as it is being pierced, so to speak, by the current flow. OK, so this is the current. This is the surface where we need to integrate to find the total current. Uh, and uh, that is what I will do now. By the way, the voltage here is being set to V0. We have actually set the voltage between the two conductors with the source. And therefore, there is nothing here to actually uh, calculate in the numerator. So in the numerator, things are fairly easy. So for the denominator, I take a length of the cable equal to L, and I proceed with the calculation. So the current, J dot ds, is equal to, I replace the expression for the current, And now the ds, again, you see, I uh, had to do some thinking to understand what is the area where I integrate, what is the surface that I integrate. But even if I wanted to blindly figure out what should I integrate, I should look at the current. The current is flowing in the radial direction. I see here cylindrical coordinates. So if you go to your uh, aid sheet again, the only ds that has r hat in front of it is this ds. r defined is that there is no other. Any other ds that you use will give you a dot product which is equal to 0. So it makes sense that this ds will have to be used. And then you see that I, the variables that I integrate are phi and z. Phi will vary from 0 to 2 pi because I'm going all around the cylinder. And um, z will go, let's say, from 0 to L because I'm taking a length L of the cable. So r dot r is equal to 1. Then I have a bunch of constants here, which are sigma v naught logarithm of b over a in the denominator. Uh, r and r here cancel out, and I have two very easy integrals to do, 0 to 2 pi d phi and 0 to L dz. So this give me 2 pi L sigma v naught logarithm of b over a. And now I can calculate the resistance of uh, this cable, and the resistance due to the current flow in the area in between the conductors, I have to emphasize this, is V0 over I. Uh, and uh, that is V0 2 pi L sigma V0 L and B over A. So you see the v naughts cancel out. As we said yesterday, resistance would not be a thing if it depended on V0. V0 has to cancel out. And the final expression has to be it has to depend only on parameters of the cable itself. So A and B are parameters of the geometry. Sigma is the conductivity. And therefore, we have um, 1 over 2 pi L sigma logarithm of B over A. So this is the resistance that we have. If we want to check the dimensions here, the dimensions of the resistance, the dimensions of the expression that we found. You see here we have meters. Here we have Siemens per meter. So it's 1 over Siemens, which means it's ohms. So as we uh, were expecting, the dimensions of resistance are indeed in ohms. Any questions up to this point? So you see this is a little bit 
counterintuitive current flow because we're talking about the current that flows in between the two uh, conductors. Uh, but this nevertheless can be defined and calculated and we just need to find the current density and integrate it over the cylinder through which this current flow takes place. So that, that is it. Uh, until you understand the concept, you can also game this type of questions. You see the J, the J is in the radial direction, so the DS that you need to choose is the one that points in the direction of J. And uh, from that point on, uh, you just need to figure out the uh, length of the integration. So obviously, it also has to depend on, uh, on the length. All right, uh, so uh, next, I'd like to show now the calculation of ohmic power dissipated in this cable. So how much power are we losing? The volume density of that power is sigma e squared, volume density. So that means that's how much power we are losing per unit volume. Which means now that if I want to find the total power that is being lost, I have to integrate this sigma e squared, that is sigma uh, v naught squared logarithm of b over a squared um, r squared. Okay, so this is sigma times electric field squared. I need to integrate it over the entire volume of this space in between the two conductors. So this dv. Hence, I need to use the dv in cylindrical coordinates, which is r d phi dr dz. And then uh, you see again, I'm uh, splitting the integral in integrals with respect to the three variables. I have here uh, some constants. Then r and r squared will give me 1 over r. So I have the dr over r. That varies between the inner and the outer conductor. So varies from A to B. And then I have uh, d phi that varies from 0 to 2 pi. And uh, dz from 0 to L. Okay, so this is the integration. Uh, this will give me 1 over r, integral of 1 over r is the logarithm of r. So that will give me logarithm of b over a. Uh, this will give me 2 pi. And this will give me L. So I'm pushing this upwards. So the total power that I am losing in that cable in these ohmic losses So this ohmic power uh, dissipated, I simply uh, put this formula together. It's sigma v naught squared. There is a cancellation partial of this logarithm. There is a square in the denominator. Uh, there is uh, an LMB over A in the numerator. So there is an LMB over A here. And I have the 2 pi L. And notice that this result is, can be cast in the form v naught squared divided by ln b over a by 2 pi l sigma. So it is what uh, you have seen before in circuits, uh, in the analysis of circuits, v naught squared over r. So it is equal to v naught squared over r. So that's why these are all, uh, all these formulas are equivalent to each other. And what we see here 
is the rediscovery of formulas you have seen in circuits, in circuit analysis, from now a physics perspective, from, uh, from first principles. And of course, uh, you remember that uh, R is uh, V naught uh, over I, so therefore this is also uh, I not uh, I squared times R. So you see here, I use this uh, formula of the power density to find the power losses, and uh, from that the ohmic power, and I end it up with uh, this uh, V squared over R, or I squared times R formula that you have seen uh, before in uh, circuits. So how much power is this? Typically, those materials in between dielectrics would have a very low conductivity. Uh, the, we're putting materials in between conductors of a coaxial cable to support those conductors because they have to be supported instead of suspended in air. And uh, therefore, we're not silly. We put materials with, high, with low conductivities in between so that we don't short circuit the two conductors. So, for a material with conductivity 10 to minus 3, let's say uh, Siemens per meter, and uh, a typical ratio between the inner and the outer conductor equal to 3, and for 1 volt and length 1 meter, so that we calculate the per meter loss that we have, this power, if you put the numbers, the 1 meter, the 10 to minus 3 Siemens per meter, and uh, the 1 volt squared, and the, LN, the logarithm of uh, uh, 3, the logarithm of 3 will give you about uh, six, uh, 0 0.0069 uh, watts. So you have about, you are losing at every meter about 69 uh, milliwatts. So it's not, uh, a, it's not a, a negligible uh, loss. So this is uh, an example. Any uh, questions up to this point? Yes, please. I'd like to ask how you got the, the differential terms in the, in the integral and the Uh, so the um, differential volume element in cylindrical coordinates is this one. Oh. It's R d phi d r d z. If you, we have it in uh, the aid sheet, but if you want to see it, uh, imagine that you, have, uh, you are within the cylinder and you have this point, uh, which uh, starts from coordinates r phi z, right? And then uh, if you go along the radial direction, you are writing a length dr. If you now make a turn along the phi direction, that is you uh, move on a circle around, you write an arc length d phi. And now if you go up by dz, you are writing a length dz. So then you have uh, defined like this a volume that looks like uh, a cuboid. Uh, so it has a volume d phi, uh, r d phi, d r d z. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I was when we're taking the direction for current density, um, would we ever take it um, in like the z hat direction, or like why do we always take it in the r hat direction? Uh, I don't always take it in one direction or another. J is equal sigma e. So the, the current is proportional to the electric field. So in this case, we are calculating currents due to the electric field in the space in between. So if the electric field is in the R direction, the current will be in the R direction. And that makes sense because fundamentally it's the electric field that pushes the charges. And therefore, 
if I'm pushing in the radial direction, the charges will go in the radial direction, and therefore the current will be in that direction too. Yeah. Any other questions? Other questions? Okay. So now let me uh, just uh, make one more note about conductors before I go to uh, dielectrics, and that will be on perfect conductors. So if you remember yesterday, I, I gave you an axis of how free are the electrons and um, other particles within the crystal of a medium. If all charges are free, then we're talking about a perfect conductor. If all charges are bound, we're talking about a perfect dielectric. And we have the space in between where some are free, uh, some are bound. In perfect conductors, all charges are free, and typically the charges that we're talking about are electrons. So in a perfect conductor, we have this limit that all oops, electrons are free to move. And uh, we describe this in terms of conductivity as the limit where the conductivity tends to infinity. So this is an approximation that is uh, well met by materials like uh, silver that has conductivity As I showed uh, yesterday, uh, conductivity is 6.2 times 10 to the 7th, or copper, which has conductivity, in, again, in the millions, uh, 58 million Siemens per meter. So practically, we're not talking about infinity. We're talking about a very, very high value that we can take practically as infinity. Now, from your circuit slabs, you know that if you take a copper wire and you connect it to a voltage source, you will measure a current. That current is not infinite. Uh, it has some value. So if you look at the relation between uh, current and electric field in that limit, when sigma goes to infinity, and the current remains finite, and you, as you know from your um, experience, that means what about the electric field? Any ideas? So how can a product of something that goes to infinity with something else give you a finite number? Zero. So it has to tend to zero. Of course, this is not. Um, you know, mathematically very rigorous, but you, you see what I'm saying, that practically the electric field inside such perfect conductors will be uh, zero or will tend to zero. And uh, there is another argument that supports this. So electric field is zero. So there is another argument that supports this, that indeed, if you were taken, uh, if you had taken a material like this one, like a perfect conductor, and you assume that this is, this reaches a state of equilibrium. That is, there is some charge distribution inside the conductor that is static charge distribution and produces, um, so assume that there is some charges inside this conductor and they produce some non-zero field. You are led immediately to a contradiction. Why? Because the non-zero field would always move 
the free charges inside the conductor. Since I can never get rid of, this is a perfect conductor, I can never get rid of free charges, all charges are free to move. And therefore, if I assume that there is a static charge distribution with a non-zero field, then I'm led to a contradiction because a non-zero field would actually start moving the charges since the charges are free. And hence, either by the one argument or by the other argument, you are led to the same conclusion that in fact, on a perfect conductor, uh, the electric field will have to be zero. And by the way, in your textbook and other textbooks, when uh, you see the term conductor without any conductivity specified, typically they mean a perfect conductor. And then we mean that uh, uh, this is a structure where the electric field is zero. What is the uh, consequence of this? First of all, perfect conductors are equipotential surfaces. are equipotential surfaces. This fact actually has been evident, nobody asked so far, in the examples that we have done. And I will show you why. First of all, why the perfect conductors are equipotential surfaces? Because if you take a perfect conductor of any shape, okay, and you take any point one and two, between the conductor. You remember the definition of the potential, V21 minus 1 to 2 E dot DL. But the electric field here is zero. So if I go to these points through the conductor, as I can, because this uh, integral is path independent, this will be always zero. So therefore, no matter what two points I choose, along a conductor, the conductor will be an equipotential surface and the potential will be zero. Okay. Where have we seen and used this fact? Many places. For example, For example, when you draw a circuit diagram, I'm not talking about this course, I'm talking about school, let's say. High school or uh, other circuit classes. You never question whether the potential here is equal to the potential there. This is for you a short circuit. And indeed, uh, it is a short circuit because we consider that the wire has been made out of a conductor that practically behaves as a perfect conductor, and therefore this is an equipotential surface. Uh, when you say, okay, I'm putting here a ground, so I ground this conductor, so that means that I, con I make a connection here to the ground, and then everything comes to zero potential. Well, this is because these are all conductors, and hence this is an equipotential surface, and through the connection, it uh, now has the same potential with the ground, and the ground and your wire becomes one single conductor that has the same potential. Uh, but we have seen this as well here in these examples. For example, when we uh, solved for the Laplace equation uh, the capacitor fields, and we said, let's put the source in here, connected to the top and the bottom conductor, and that makes the potential here zero and the potential here, sorry, V naught and the potential here zero. Or in this very example we just solved, where we said we have here the coaxial cable. I connect a voltage source and that makes the potential here V naught and the potential here zero because I ground this. All these hold because these conductors are equipotential surfaces. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to proceed. If uh, uh, we were not able to say that I connect a voltage source here, but now the potential can change along the conductor, then 
we wouldn't be able to proceed at all. So that these are all uh, things that are related to the fact that the conductors are equipotential surfaces. Uh, the second uh, important part of this is that, as we have seen, the electric field is always perpendicular to equipotential surfaces. So, It's always perpendicular to equipotentials, and since the conductors are equipotentials, they, it will also be perpendicular to conductors. And again, I mean uh, here, perfect conductors. And the field that I'm talking about is the external field. Inside, it is uh, zero. So, for example, if we have an electric field that has been formed by this charge distribution. Okay. And I bring into the field now a conductor, a conducting cylinder. So I bring into the field a conducting cylinder. What happens? What happens is that the field will get distorted. So I bring in a perfect conductor here. Let me call it PC. And the presence of that will actually severely distort the field. And the lines that will be hitting the conductor will have to hit the conductor at 90 degrees, precisely because the conductor is an equipotential surface. And hence, the electric field on equipotential surfaces will have to be, uh, will have to meet the surface at 90 degrees. So that will be the distortion of uh, this field. That also gives us some insights as to what happens inside the conductor and how come the field inside the conductor is actually equal to zero. What does it mean that these field lines are hitting the surface, are sinking into the surface? And what does it mean that these field lines are emanating from the surface? What are sinks of electric fields and uh, sources of electric fields? Le yes. Negative charges. charges. Remember, lecture one, and I told you this is an important concept that will accompany us throughout the course. These field lines tell me, sinking on the conductor, tell me that there is a negative charge distribution on the surface of the conductor. And these tell me that there is a positive charge distribution on the surface of the conductor. So that brings me to the last note that there are no charge, volume charge distributions within a conductor. There can be no volume charge density. Because all charges are free, um, if you had, uh, let's say, some electric field there, they would just move out. The, the, the distribution inside the conductor would be dispersed. But this also can be seen from Gauss's law. Gauss's law says that divergence of the electric field is rho v divided by epsilon naught. But inside the conductor, there is no electric field. Hence, there is no divergence either. And then rho sub v has to be equal to 0. So one may say, all these free charges, where are they in the conductor? Well, what happens is that they distribute themselves on the surface 
and they give rise to these surface charge densities. moving to the surface of the conductor. So you see what has happened here. You have this external field that points from left to right. And then the charges in the cylinder rearrange themselves. And if you look at these charges, that means that they are creating an electric field that points the other way. And you see that that electric field is strong enough so that the external field and the internal field cancel exactly out. And hence the total field inside the conductor. So you have inside the conductor an exact cancellation between the external field that tries to push charges to, from, left to, from left to right and the internal field that uh, pushes charges from right to left. And then inside the conductor, the electric field is zero. So these are the physics of how the electric field is zero inside the conductor. The fact that inside we don't have any volume charge densities and everything has to go as a result onto the surface. Yes, please. So if there's no electric field, the charges distribute such that they cancel out internally, so the E inside remains zero? Yes. So the electric field will have to be zero inside, yes. So assuming the perfect conductor that you so yeah. is, it, is the positive and the negative side out, outside the surface, are they equally distributed? Because I'm seeing some of them are going in and some of them are going out. Well, uh, whether they will be equally or unequally, that will depend on the symmetry of the problem. Here that I have put a, an exact cylinder, yes, they will be equally distributed. But if the cylinder was distorted, you had an elliptical cable, let's say, or I don't know, even a rectangular cable, then it doesn't have to be equally distributed. But it will be, it, it, you see, it, the, when you have an electric field from outside coming in, right? So it comes into the conductor, then charges start moving. The only state of equilibrium, because all charges are free inside the perfect conductor, the only state of equilibrium that can be achieved by the system is when the electric field inside is zero. If you have the slightest non-zero electric field, you cannot have equilibrium because there are always charges that are available to move. So that is the, that is the thing. So therefore, they will redistribute until the electric field is zero, exactly, and then that's a state of equilibrium, the only one that you can achieve with this perfect conductor. Okay. So you can see it from different perspectives, either from the current to electric field perspective or this perspective of the state of equilibrium. The point is, uh, they are uh, equipotential surfaces, electric field is normal. Does anybody remember why I say this? Uh, on the equipotential surface, electric field has to be normal? Because uh, since the voltage is zero and voltage is like the E into DL, right? So. That's right. So dV is equal to minus E dot DL from our definition of the voltage and therefore on an equipotential surface, dV is equal to zero. That means this dot product has to be equal to zero. And that happens when the two are perpendicular to each other. So if I move around the conductor and I see no potential difference, by definition, that means that the electric field and the surface of the conductor have to be perpendicular to each other. So that is why this distortion is uh, is uh, caused with uh, the electric field lines uh, distorted along the conductor. Yes? So is DL in this case the surface of the conductor? Yes, yes, yes. So if I'm moving here, right, if I'm moving here, let's say I'm putting a DL, right, this is an equipotential surface, so therefore E dot DL has to be zero. So that tells me that the electric field will have to be along the normal direction, cannot be anywhere else. Right? No matter how close I take those points, and I define a DL that is exactly tangential to the conductor, E that DL will have to be zero, no matter what. So that means that the electric field will have to meet the conductor at 90 degrees. Is that uh, clear? Yeah. Does okay. it always meet at 90 degrees? Yes, yes. Equipotential surfaces, the conductor, the uh, electric field has to be uh, perpendicular. We saw it here, by the way. So you see, this is radial direction 
this is cylinder. So that means that the electric field lines here were perpendicular to this, perpendicular to that, and perpendicular to any cylinder in between that are equipotential surfaces. And cylinders here are equipotential surfaces because the potential only depends on R, just like the field. Uh, we showed this uh, last week. So this uh, latest um, example or note brings me now to dielectrics. That will be uh, the last uh, type of material that we will uh, see in this part of the course. And dielectrics are materials that are complementary now to the conductors. That is all or the opposite, I must say. All charges are bound. So when I say dielectrics, let me just uh, say perfect dielectrics. Uh, the, uh, then the same note holds here as before with conductors that if uh, someone talks to you about dielectrics without saying anything else, without giving you conductivity, for example, that means perfect dielectrics. Practically, when I have a dielectric like this that I buy to make printed circuit boards, the manufacturer tells me that there is some small conductivity in the order of 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5 Siemens per meter. Okay. But um, so unless uh, it is explicitly stated that the dielectric has some conductivity, we consider it as a perfect dielectric. In the perfect dielectric, all charges are bound and conductivity is exactly zero. So bound to what? Bound to nuclei. And uh, if we uh, consider, uh, and uh, by the way, in terms of, uh, I think we said this uh, yesterday, in terms of uh, what does zero mean here for conductivity? Because we know nothing is either zero or infinity. Everything has a value. Uh, so the conductivity for glass, for example, is 10 to minus 12 Siemens per meter. Uh, even for silicon, 4.4 times 10 to minus 4 Siemens per meter. So these are relatively small conductivity. So let's consider just sigma equal to zero. All charges are bound to their nuclei, we're typically talking about electrons that are bound to positively charged nuclei. So if we consider a perfect dielectric slab, and we look at it in the micro scale, we will see positively charged nuclei surrounded by electrons, something like this. Now consider the capacitor that we had solved before uh, with uh, charge Q here and minus Q here in empty space. That will establish, as we have seen, an electric field that points from the positive charges to the negative charges. We saw actually that this electric field would be minus Z hat Surface charge density, let me, uh, now that I have the charges, consider an area here A. So the surface charge density on these two plates is Q over A. So let me just put it in, Q over A, and we saw that the field will be surface charge density divided by epsilon naught, right? So if this is empty space. So now let's try to insert this dielectric slab into the capacitor and see what happens. So I take the capacitor with its field and I insert now this dielectric slab. Any ideas what happens? 
First of all, the charges cannot move because we say they have to be bound. What else can, what else can happen though? Go ahead. S sorry, I'm not sure who. Yeah, you said something. Yeah, go ahead. The field decreases in size. The electric field. Okay. Uh, fundamentally, what happens though before the electric field decreases? I agree with you, but why does it decrease? So something more fundamental happens, which is yeah. Go ahead. And the charges are like moving around, so they're moving. Not moving, but they will be displaced. They cannot really move, but they can be displaced. So what happens is really the fundamental, that these positive charges in the nuclei will be attracted by the negative charges in the lower plate, and the negative charges here will be attracted by the positive charges. Because we have a dielectric, they are bound within the area of the nucleus, so still they cannot move, so they cannot give me a current. That, that is what conductivity equals zero means. But you see these uh, positive charges will go towards the negative charges and the negative charges towards the positive charges. So something like this will happen. So we have the formation of things that look like dipoles you remember the electric dipole we discussed on uh, the first lecture this week uh, with the positive and negative charge displaced by, from each other? And this is exactly what we see here. So the negative charges are attracted to the positive plate and the positive charges are attracted to the negative plate. However, they cannot move. They just remain bound. They are just being stretched. So this is a phenomenon that is called polarization of the dielectric. Because I started from an electrically neutral uh, view. We had uh, just these uh, uh, clouds of electrically neutral molecules. And now with the stretching, imagine like a spring that uh, you are uh, stretching and you are displacing, but you are not stretching hard enough so that you break the spring. So the two spheres are still attached to the spring. And all you can do is just displace them, increase their distance. So that's exactly what happens here. Now, your classmate said that the electric field decreases. And indeed, the reason that it decreases is that these dipoles now have fields. They form fields. And again, it goes back to our fundamental observation. Electric field goes from positive charges to negative charges. So now that you see these polarized molecules, you can immediately see field lines that are forming from the positive to the negative charges. So just like those redistributed charges on the surface of the conductor, we have now these uh, dipoles in the micro scale that are opposing the external electric field. As a result, the external field decreases, and the factor that it decreases is actually a characteristic factor of the material. Again, we have a situation where a very complex phenomenon takes place in the micro scale, but we have a very efficient, very engineering-oriented quantity to describe it. So the total field decreases. by a factor epsilon sub bar, which is a characteristic uh, number for this material, for a dielectric material, and it's called the relative dielectric permittivity. The relative dielectric permittivity. So as a result, the electric field will become minus z hat 
q over a, epsilon naught, and now we have to add another factor, epsilon r. And it is precisely because this action-reaction principle that is uh, at work here that the electric field inside the dielectric is uh, decreased. So I will uh, stop here and we'll stick around for questions and we'll continue with dielectrics uh, next week. So thanks for your attention. See you next week.